chapter 10 this evening, 1 Corinthians at chapter 10 tonight. If you need a Bible, there are many available in the chairs around you. They are the black book, and we also have a number of them around the, uh, around the room as well. So if you see somebody and they need a Bible, help them out and make sure you get one in their hands because I want to show you this evening that what we're looking at is what the Scripture says. I have in my lifetime many times heard uh, dynamic preaching, dynamic messages. That is uh, pretty powerful preaching. And uh, I, I have, though, realized uh, that sometimes it's man's power and sometimes it's God's power. Uh, I'm troubled a little bit when a preacher would say, I have a sermon. And he'd talk about his sermon that he preaches. There's a sermon that I preach, and I think, well, I have a Bible that I preach. You have a sermon that you preach, which has more authority. Well, the Word of God has the authority. And if it's the Word of God that you're preaching, it isn't your sermon, it's God's. It's, it's not your message, it's God's message. But I have heard dynamic sermons. I've heard terrible sermons, which made such an impression on me that I cannot forget them. And, uh, and I'm serious. I've heard great sermons I've, that, that made a good impression on I me. Mean, I, it's, 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 it's stamped itself into my mind, my memory. And I've also heard terrible messages, which are unforgettable for the very same reason. And, uh, you know, when I ask the question as a pastor being responsible, not only for the oversight of the church, but to preach the Word and to be in and out of season and to be responsible to make sure that I, we teach the Word of God in our church, I ask the question, what would be better? Would it be better if somebody goes away and remembers a message that I preach or if they go away and they know the Word of God? Mm. And I'm not saying that one necessarily precludes the other. You could have both. But if we had to choose between the two, we want you to know the Scripture. Amen. And that is why the emphasis oftentimes of our preaching is uh, more exposi expositing the Scripture. It is not, uh, it's not because you know, we just don't know any other way. It's because this is the best way for you to leave and say, I know where it is in the Bible. I, I can remember some sermons uh, when I was a teenager being preached and where you literally had to sit on the edge of your seat and it was like a sword drill. Now turn here, now turn there, now turn here, now turn there, now turn here, now turn there in the Bible from place to place to place. And, uh, you know, it's just you barely keep up. You're trying to take notes and you're trying to pay attention. You're trying to turn everywhere. And at the end of it, you know, you're just amazed. You're like, wow, you know, well, they really put that together, you know. And later on, with a little more experience, I realized, first of all, they probably just used a Strong's Concordance and looked up a word, and they're having to turn to every instance where the word is used in the Bible. <laughs> and a lot of times is the way that type of preaching is. Uh, but secondly, the second thing I realized is that I really don't know any particular text in its context. I just know the topic of whatever the word was that we turned from word to word to word in. I'm not saying that there isn't profit in it. There is profit in that kind of Bible study. But it would be great, wouldn't it, if you sat through the entire sermon series of 1 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 1 all the way to the end of, the, of this letter, and afterward, in your mind, you could recollect, you could rethink about what 1 Corinthians is about. That is, you had a handle on the teaching of the Scripture. You could say, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul is introducing himself to the church and he right away gets down to business by uh, telling them that he's heard that there's divisions among them because some people would say that I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and others I'm of Christ. Chapter 2, Paul diagnoses the problem as you're not spiritual. You're carnal. You're fleshly. And that's the reason you're fo looking at it like you're following a man, but you're supposed to follow the man of God that God has called as you follow Jesus Christ. And if you could progress through 1 Corinthians chapter 3 all the way to where we're at this evening, uh, you'd see the different topics covered. 1 Corinthians 5 makes an enormous impression on me because it deals with sin in the church, gross, blatant sin. And uh, the people were called puffed up because they had not judged the sin. Chapter 6 really dealt with the reality that end of believers in the church were taking each other before an unjust judge, before an unjust court. And we're, as believers, going to rule the world someday with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we can't judge one, you know, and we're, if we're supposed to judge the world, shouldn't we be able to judge ourselves in the church? And what a tragedy that was. But what gets my attention a great deal is that really chapter 5 begins talking about 
uh, fornication. And that topic of fornication is covered all the way through chapter 7. And then we pick up in chapter 8, uh, and, and chapter 7, 8, and 9, we start talking about the connecting sin between fornication, which is adultery. I, it, adultery. Idolatry. Uh, and it's really interesting that it looked as though last week when we were in chapter 9, when we're talking about Paul's right as an apostle to be taken care of by the church, by the ministry, and as he defended his apostleship, you'd think we'd turn the corner. But here we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'd like you to notice a couple of words that come up in the verses that we're uh, going to preach this evening. Verse uh, chapter 10 beginning in verse 6, speaking of the children of Israel, um, in verse 6, Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Now notice verse 7, Neither be ye... What's that next word? Idolaters. I thought we were done with that. Idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And then verse 8, neither let us commit, what's that next word? Fornication. Fornication. I thought we were done with that subject. As some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Now, we're going to go ahead this evening and uh, read verse 14, and then we'll pray and we'll try to just kind of fill in the empty space in between and cover some topics. I want to preach, uh, I want to, want to cover uh, two this evening, uh, two points, but might be willing to make it through one tonight and have to pick up next week. We'll, we'll try to be conscious of time. Father, thank You so much tonight for the Scripture, for the authority of it. And Lord, I pray that this warning about idolatry and fornication, which seem to always come up in the same context, or would be sufficient for us to be warned, and that God also we would look at the example of national Israel according to the flesh and how that they fell as a result of these sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, when we preached about fornication, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you would think, for me, it's just not one of those topics that I enjoy covering or talking about. But when you see how much it's dealt with in the Scripture, you see not only how pervasive it is, but how destructive it is, how, how much it was in the first century church. Now, my friend, let me ask you a practical question. How much effect does sexual sin have in our culture today? Today, uh, today somebody was texting me uh, online, I said, whatever, messaging me, online asking questions about the matter of fornication and, you know, how do you protect children? And, you know, the fact of the matter is that the concern every parent has is if I shield or I protect my children or if I if I don't handle the topic with them myself they're going to hear about it from someone else in some other place they may go to a Christian school they may uh, go to, to a public school but they're going to hear about things that children really should know about you cannot drive down I-95 and not see things which cause which appeal to the lust of the flesh or to fornication isn't it so you know you can't sit behind a taxi cab and not see advertisements with things that are inappropriate for the eyes to see. And uh, our society and the Satan uses fornication uh, to destroy the lives of believers. And so, again, it's not, uh, it's not a topic it's that you know I would want to preach about or talk about. I'm very uncomfortable, actually, uh, talking about it. But the reality of it is that it is one of the few commands in the New Testament for believers to abstain from is fornication and idolatry. Those two things. Acts chapter 15, when the when the apostles went back to the Jerusalem church and asked, what, how much of the law are the Gentiles required to keep? The answer was, they don't have to be circumcised, they don't have to keep the law, but they have to abstain from fornication, and they have to abstain from meat offered to idols, and from things strangled. So God thinks it's kind of a big deal, doesn't He? Now, what, how many new commandments do we have in the New Testament? Remember before Jesus went to the cross, He said in John 13, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, so shall all men know that you are my disciples. There aren't a lot of New Testament commandments, are there? But one that is reiterated over and again and again and again 
is to abstain from fornication. And so I warn you, believer, that if it was a big deal in the first century, that it's a big deal today. It's an important matter. Matter of fact, I think probably more Christians are waylaid by the sin of fornication than any other sin. Oftentimes it's an inappropriate relationship. If anything will get someone away from their relationship with the Lord, it's a matter of fornication. If anything gets a stronghold, a stranglehold in a believer's life, it is fornication. It's interesting, as I mentioned several weeks ago, uh, when you do a study on fornication and you, and you just uh, do like a, uh, a special search with a software tool, for instance, and you ask, what are some related topics to fornication? The related topic, the most related topic to fornication is idolatry. In other words, in the Scripture, when fornication is mentioned, idolatry is also mentioned. Matter of fact, the first instance, we saw this several weeks ago, the first instance that fornication is mentioned in the Bible, it is mentioned in context along with uh, idolatry, with setting up high places and causing people to worship. False religion, my friend, usually normally incorporates some form of fornication or prostitution or some kind of inappropriate physical sin or relationship. And that is the appeal, actually, of fornication. And so it's a big deal. I think sometimes as Christians we're a little bit naive, a little bit more so than we ought to be. And so when the Scripture warns us as much as it does, and here we've, uh, you know, we, we've seen so many other, uh, other important contexts introduced and topics introduced, and then we go right back to the matter of fornication again. You have to say this is a big deal. If, if God's Word, if Paul understands that the church at Corinth is going to be waylaid or supplanted by this sin, then it's a big deal. So first of all, he uses the illustration of national Israel. What did they do? What did national Israel do when Moses went up to meet God to receive God's commandments for the children of Israel? What happened when Moses came back from God giving him the commandments? What? Idolatry, man. They made a golden calf to worship while Moses was on the mountain. The first thing they did. Look at this in uh, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that she should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, unless you know the Scripture, that seems a little mysterious. But you know what the cloud was, right? Remember there's a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The cloud was what? It represented what? The glory of God. God's presence. Literally, that cloud that was with the children of Israel as they were in the wilderness said, God is with me. When they passed through the Red Sea, they passed through on dry land. Who caused the dry land? God did. And Paul is saying the children of Israel had a real life, real God experience. I mean, at nighttime there was a fire, pillar of fire. God was in the fire. In the daytime there was a cloud. God was was in the cloud. I've heard people preach grandiose messages about how at nighttime the fire kept them warm and in the daytime, you know, the cloud kept them shaded. No, 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 no. That, that had nothing to do with the cloud. Simply concealed the presence of God. In other words, the cloud said, God is with me. It wasn't, oh, it's over the top of you and it's shady all the time in the desert. It wasn't some miraculous, you know, a natural phenomenon. No, it was God is in the cloud. You know, you couldn't see God face to face. You'd die. So the cloud, the cloud shielded God's presence. And about two and a half million, maybe three million, we don't know the exact number, but several million people saw the cloud all day and saw the fire at night and knew God was with them. They came out of the mightiest nation in the world, walked out, Pharaoh's armies pursued them, and God destroyed Pharaoh's armies and, and protected them. They, they knew who God was. Anybody here ever had the water parted and walked through it? Going through the Red Sea, my friend, is a pretty incredible experience, wasn't it? I mean, you would like to have a Red Sea experience in your life. I mean, just a Red Sea experience. Pretty neat to have something that really, you're like, God really, 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 really is real. You know, I mean, I walked through the Red Sea on dry land, and I watched Pharaoh's armies coming after me, and I watched the waters close in over them, and we were protected. We had God's presence with us all the time, and God spoke to Moses all the time for us. The children of Israel had a real, live, actual God experience. 
I don't know a better way to phrase it or put it, and that may sound a little crude to you, but that's an important thing for us to note. They knew who God was. Their experience with Him was real. You'd think then that it would naturally follow that any person who had a real life God experience would not have any kind of a temptation to worship a false God if you know who the true God is. Shouldn't that be the logical progression in thinking? Why worship a calf that Aaron made out of gold when I worship God who made man, made the world, made everything? Why worship something man-made when you can worship Creator God? Doesn't make any sense, does it? In verse 3, they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And notice this in the rock. That rock was Christ. Now, that's a separate Bible study for you to look at how that God provided spiritual water for the children of Israel in the desert. Uh, they had spiritual meat. Where did they get their food from? What? Yeah, the ground. I mean, it just fell on the ground. They had quail and they had manna. And God provided it. If you're in the wilderness, you know there's, you know, you can survive in the wilderness. But you ever watch, you know, any of these guys that go out in the desert and try to survive by chasing down lizards and snakes and eating them, that sort of thing? You notice they, they're, they're, they're not usually, um, uh, they're not normally very heavy set. I can put it that way, you know? <laughs> this is, never mind. I about went off on a tangent. I'm not going to. So give me a point. All right, for not going on a tangent. Uh, <laughs> the children of Israel had everything they needed to eat every day. They had all the water they could drink in a place where there was no food, no water. And again, that was an evidence to them that what? Supernatural God was with them and providing for them. So that, that was their experience. Their experience is that they literally saw the presence of God in a cloud and fire. They... They experienced the provision of God through the water that came through the rock, and through the bread that was that uh, was on the on the ground in the mornings. And then in verse five, the Bible says, "But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness." Mm. It's just not the expected conclusion, isn't it? I mean, it really ought to go like this: These are the experiences of the children of Israel as they journeyed from Egypt. By day, the pillar of fire, the cloud was with them. By night, the pillar of fire. Every day, they were provided with uh, food that came up or came on the ground, bread or manna and quail. And whenever they needed water to drink, water was provided out of a rock. Or if there was a stream which was bitter, then they simply would cut a piece of, uh, of uh, wood and put it in the stream and the, and the water turned sweet. And so they knew that God was with them and so they thrived spiritually and followed only God and worshipped only God. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's how the story ought to read, isn't it? But no, they made idols and worshipped idols. Listen to me, my friend. Truth will not anchor you unless you're anchored to the truth. One of the things I'm reminded about is that experience is not what validates us first as God's children. A spiritual experience does not mean that you're God's child. I think that spiritual experiences oftentimes are used by the Satan to distract people from being God's child. Mm. You're to tell the children of Israel, you know, you need to put your faith in Jesus. You say, Pastor, in that dispensation, they know who Jesus was. Nonsense, they did. Jesus was that spiritual rock. That's what the Scripture says, you Ruckmanites, <laughs> if you like, to, like that one. Uh, the reality of it is, is that salvation's always been by faith in Christ. And the, the notion that people didn't understand the prophecy, the prophets didn't understand the prophecy about Jesus and so forth, it's nonsense. It isn't so at all. But the reality of it is that the, uh, the, the, the children of Israel, these believers, as they were in, in the wilderness, they had, whether they're believers or not, they had food. And whether they're believers or not, they had water. You see. And my friend... It's, again, a reminder that going to church, going to a good church, isn't the same as knowing Christ as your Savior. 
You have to have your own relationship with God. And the evidence that these individuals, their carcasses, the Bible says in other places, dropped off in the wilderness, the evidence that they did not know God was not just their propensity toward idolatry. It was the fact they had these experiences and yet they didn't have any personal relationship with God. As I look at it, oftentimes, you know, I, I think of the children, the childhood stories where, you know, you see the cartoon character, Egyptian taskmaster, cracking a whip on uh, Israeli Jewish people making bricks. And they were, you know, you see that, they, you know, you, they were so burdened, so they were crying out to God for help. So God sent Moses to rescue them. One thing missing in the Bible is the children of Israel crying out for help. You just, it's just, just not there. You think, oh, they just want to be rescued. They want to be delivered. If they wanted to be delivered, they'd been pretty open to it when Moses killed the Egyptian taskmaster instead of tattling on him. They didn't want Moses to lead them out of Egypt. God brought them out with a mighty hand, with a strong hand. They didn't want God to interfere in their lives. Over and over again, their complaint with God was, God, why have you brought us out in the wilderness to die? We were happy in Egypt. And that's the way they felt about it. My friend, there are a lot of people who are happy to be involved with idolatry and fornication, and they don't want their world shaken up by truth. But God's God, and that's the truth. And so, Paul here uses the illustration to the church, to individuals who are believers, who are also susceptible to fornication. Paul uses the illustration in verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. He's talking about literally what happened when the people committed idolatry. They also committed fornication. What they were doing when Moses came back and said there's a sound of war in the camp was absolutely as wicked as it could be. And we're reminded of how wicked we can be even we who are redeemed and bought back. Friend, you're capable of anything. You say, Pastor, I yeah, you know, I don't really think so. Well, let's just jump ahead just just a little bit then. Um, a couple of verses to verse eleven. Now all these things happen unto them for in samples. That's another word for example, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Okay, so we're the last group that gets to profit by their their lives illustration. Verse 12 then, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. It could never happen to me. Now, I, you know, when I got saved, I meant I was sincere and I trusted Jesus as my Savior. When I gave my life to Christ, I'm never going back. Well, my friend, God saved you, no question about that. Your salvation is not dependent upon your works. never was. You could never have been saved if it were dependent on you. But if you think that you can't fall, you're sadly mistaken. And there are a lot of illustrations of individuals who are better than us, who had greater experiences, more real experiences with God. And they've fallen. And Paul said, they're your example. And we see in verse 13, a very, very helpful scripture in its context. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. Now stop there. You know, we could preach a message in verse 13, couldn't we? Stop thinking you're so unique when you go through difficulties and hardship in life. I appreciated something a brother in Christ sent me this week. They told me three terrible things that happened in their life, and then they summarized it by basically saying, yeah, I guess this is just pretty normal. <laughs> three things, three, three terrible things that happened in their life that day, and then their summary was, yeah, you know, I mean, life's hard. It's pretty normal. It happens to everybody, doesn't it? It's kind of their conclusion. Like, well, it's no excuse for me not to follow Jesus because life's tough. The Bible says there's no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. I want to remind you of a couple of things. First of all, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the filling of our infirmities. The notion that you're the only one that's ever anything, you fill in the blank, my friend, it is, it is false, and the Scripture here refutes it adamantly. What you're going through, others are going through, others will go through, and others have gone through. And at the same time, what you're going through, God is faithful in. 
So many times we get distracted by the circumstance and we think, I'm the only one in the world that's ever gone through this, or I'm the only one in the world that is going through this, and you forget that it's common to man, mankind. That is, if you were to look to your left or your right, or in front of you or behind you, you'd see other people that are probably going through the exact same thing you are. Now, I don't mean to tell you you're not unique, but that's what I mean to tell you, just in case you think that you are. That's not very nice, Pastor. You know, we're all supposed to... No, I know. God made you for a purpose. And your purpose is unique. But listen to me, your temptation isn't. And it would be a help to you to stop thinking it is. It be a help to you to stop thinking it is. Stop thinking that your temptation is so special that you have an excuse for not having victory. Do you hear me? Sometimes we just need some hard, cold reality check. We just need to hear it like it is. And it, that's what it is. Listen, you say, Pastor, it's easy for you. Well, actually, no easier than it is for you. I have the same God that you have. I serve the same God. and I, I am equipped by the same grace that He offers you. And I find that to be vastly encouraging, actually. You know, the other thing we're reminded about, based on, the, on verse 13, is that you don't know what people are going through. You know, a victorious person normally doesn't whine a lot. You know, a victorious person usually has victory, so you don't even know the struggles they go through. They just get the W at the end. Or the V, victory. They won, right? That's the way it is. They win. A victorious person wins. And <laughs> you don't really focus on the conflict very much when you come out the other side, do you? We don't have an excuse to fail. We don't have a reason to say, okay, here's why I've, I've fallen. Here's why I've faltered. Here's, here's the reason i failed. Uh, you, you're, you make that reason, and you, you've also done one other thing, and that is to trivialize what other people are going through. When you say nobody understands or nobody has gone through, you've trivialized everyone else. And you've made light of victory that others have had. It's condescending, it's insulting, and it's not theologically accurate. Sometimes just getting our thinking straight is a help. You going through a tough time? Welcome to life. And now, God's going to help you. God will give you grace. See, that's the second part of verse 13. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? It's too much. I can't stand it. Well, tear that page out of your Bible then. Rip it out. Go ahead and send a formal complaint to God tell Him that He's wrong and He didn't know how to write this word. If you have the audacity to do that, I don't know what's going on in you. God's right, isn't He? You may not have God's grace in your life, but His grace is withheld from you not because He has not offered or extended it. It's because you've refused to receive it. The problem is not with God. And if you go trying to find fault with God, you'll never find where the fault actually is. You ever thought a problem when you're just trying to fix something? You ever thought a problem was a particular area? And you found out after you just worked and worked and worked and worked on this thing, that this wasn't the problem at all. Brother Mark was telling me about Mercury engine diagnostics. And he was saying that, you know, he's working on a boat that had three outboard motors on it. Three big Mercury motors. And, and uh, man, he had this weird, weird, weird problem. And all three engines were doing the same. And he finally went and just unhooked the control worked on the engines, worked on this engine, had a problem this engine. Finally went and unhooked the harness, and all three of them worked perfectly. It had a bad harness. It wasn't the engines at all. And if you're trying to find fault with God, you're trying to find fault where there's no problem. If there's a problem, it'll help you to just say, well, we know God's always right, so I don't have to worry about finding fault there. Now, God, help me find what's wrong with me. And guess what? God will not only put His finger on your problem, He'll give you the grace to have victory over it. He will not allow you to be, to be tempted above that you're able. And then the Bible says, but will with the temptation also provide a way of escape, a way to it, make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Okay, this is a temptation. God says, well, I'm going to give you an out. What were the two, what were the two warnings about fornication are the two ways to 
avoid fornication. You remember? In our past context, what were the two ways? Flee. flee fornication. Well, how do you flee fornication? Well, take the way of escape. What was the second way to avoid fornication? Or was the second way? Yes. Yeah, yeah, or, or get married. <laughs> okay. Yeah, now that's a major summary. There's a lot of qualification to that, right? But the reality of it is that to, in order to avoid fornication, a person was allowed to have the, the things that would be turned into lust when used the wrong way uh, to be appropriate in marriage. Now that's a long discussion. You'd have to study 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's a lot more to it than that. Matter of fact, it's probably online. You could go on YouTube and look at it as we preached through it several weeks ago. Who provides the way to escape? God does. God does. There is no way out of this. Well, that's another lie, isn't it? There is a way out of it. And God's provided it. And you, if you would say it's more than I can bear, you're not being honest. Sometimes just, just the reality check for me that I'm not being honest is enough to get me to the way of escape. Sometimes when I'm making excuses for things and I just stop and say, okay, I need to quit making excuses and just be real about this, then all of a sudden the solution comes really fast. But we sidetrack a lot, don't we? We're very, very much like the children of Israel who have all this help, have all this information, have all this access to God, have had these great experiences, and yet, they fail. Why? Well, because they didn't flee fornication. They didn't seek a way of escape. And they thought that their circumstances were more than they could bear. None of those things were true. And so the conclusion, and we'll just stand here this evening, is in verse 14. Wherefore, wherefore my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Do you see how that in our text, the evening, the verses we have read through, how that idolatry and fornication are married? It's incredible actually, isn't it? Sometimes I can't tell which one I'm talking about. The reason is because they're related. One's involved with the other, and they're not, they don't mean the same things, but they're inseparable when one commits one sin, the other one is right there with it. Now, Yep, that's where we're going to have to end this, this evening. I'm sorry, I don't have time to get into our, to our next point, which would draw a better conclusion than this this evening. But it's important for us to recognize that if the Scripture, if this letter that Paul writes to the church at Corinth, that if it this extensively over and over and over again brings up and continues on the context of idolatry and fornication, it's important for us to realize today what a stranglehold it has. See, here tonight we've been reminded, you know, idolatry and fornication, the temptation of it, it's not new. Remember the children of Israel? Remember how wonderful it was that God brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand? And you remember how they fell? It's not new. It's always been a problem. And if we in the church are going to have victory, we've got to be real about it. The seriousness of it. And another solution or another help that we've been given this evening is the reminder that there's no temptation that's taken us but such as is common to man. Not only is it not new, but it's common. But God's faithful. No excuses. And He'll provide us a way of escape that we'll be able to bear it and therefore flee fornication idolatry. Now Christian, you say, Pastor, you know, I've heard so many messages, I've probably heard more messages in the last month on fornication and idolatry than I have my entire life. You know, I hope you're left with the impression that Paul wanted to leave the church at Corinth with, that it's a big deal, it's always been a major problem, and uh, it's Satan's tool to destroy you. Uh, it's such a tragic thing when somebody is talking about fornication or idolatry and then they use words in conversation like everybody or no one. For instance, Pastor, you have to understand everybody does this. Well, that's a lie. That's a lie. And couched in the lie 
is a second lie that you have no choice about what you do. And it's just not so. It isn't true. Now everybody doesn't do that. You know, there are a couple of guys, not too many, but there are a couple guys in those millions that have pretty good testimony. Remember old Joshua and Caleb? You say, Pastor, two out of a couple of million? Well, guess who gets to choose to be the two? It's your choice. There was a common problem in Israel. It was unbelief, but ultimately it was idolatry and fornication. That was a common problem in Israel, and it waylaid them and absolutely destroyed them. But not Joshua and Caleb. Or Moses. Even Aaron, if you think about it. Even Aaron was involved with the idolatry. But not Joshua and Caleb. And not Moses. You and I need to stop looking at what everybody does and start looking at who God is. That was the difference between Joshua and Caleb. When they went into the promised land, everybody said, you know, we're like grasshoppers. These guys are giants. Joshua and Caleb are like, they're just a little bitty. God's really big. The difference? Well, Joshua and Caleb were looking to God. They'd seen God. They'd been through the Red Sea just like everyone else. They'd seen the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night like everyone else, but it made a different impression on them. So if God's able to do that, God can take us... How big is the biggest person on earth compared to God? I think the tallest man in America right now is just shy of eight foot tall. So, I guess right about that tall. He's pretty tall. Uh, if, if I were standing next to him, he'd be almost two feet taller than me. That's pretty tall. He'd be a big, imposing guy. Pretty little compared to God. It's perspective. Perspective. And victory over fornication needs perspective. That's precisely Paul's conclusion this evening. Remember the children of Israel. Remember what they had. Remember what they knew. And remember how they fell. And you watch out. You look out. You think you're standing. You better take heed lest you fall. You better be careful. Perspective. And then perspective on temptation. Pastor, it's so tough. It's so hard. Nobody in the, in the world is going through what I'm going through. Now, there's no temptation taking you but such as common to man. It's just, it's just average. It's just regular. It's big compared to your flesh. But the arm of flesh will fail you. It's small compared to God. God is faithful. Oh, the temptation is so big. Now, God is so big. You look at the temptation, it'll be big. But if you look at God, the temptation will be small. And the Bible says He'll provide you a way of escape. What do you want? What do you need? We well, should want God. You should need God. And if you desire Him, an average, ordinary individual can have extraordinary results. You can have victory over sin, my friend. you hear me tonight? You can have victory over sin. It might be that you've struggled your entire life or you've struggled for years and you've come to the place of defeat to the degree that you'd say, you know what? I can't make it. It's too big. It's too, too much of a problem. It's bigger than me. Stop looking at the problem and start looking at God. And that perspective, my friend, will be the place that you'll go in order to find the way of escape. You'll be able to bear it. You can make it. See, that's the message this evening. You can make it. You can have victory. You don't have to falter. You don't have to fail. But you better have the right perspective. God's working all around us, isn't He? God's at work all around us, isn't He? Today. He is, isn't He? And some of us, we've just seen God work. We've seen some mighty things. Some of us, though, even though we've been in the same place and seen the same things, it's just like it just goes right over us. Because we don't have our eyes on God, we're looking at everything else and everything seems more real to us than God is. 
It's a help for me on a continual basis to remember the brevity of this life, how short this life is, and the length of eternity, how long eternity is. You know, it, it, we just we feel like a 24-hour period can be so long for us. Or the life that we live on this earth can be so long, and in order to just live it for God, we just, oh, can't make it. My friend, eternity's long. This life is short. And if we live this life, this short life, with the perspective of eternity, my, will we ever have it made someday. It's all about perspective. Victory over sin, victory over fornication, victory over idolatry. And one's the same as the other, really. One, one's involved in the other. That victory comes through having your eyes on God and getting grace from God and having the right perspective about my sin's common, God's uncommon. Father, please help us this evening to absorb the truths so much so that the manner of our thinking would come into line with what Your Word teaches. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to take a few moments and, and take some time for some prayer requests before we dismiss this evening. Does anyone have anything uh, by way of a prayer request you'd like to share tonight?